now yes and we can yes you you can okay open yeah. Three, three, open three. so my name is monica lemos uh i am a doctoral student here at credo and we are now interview interviewing professor udio engelstrom engelstrom uh, the main issue is about cradle and the history of cradle and some basic foundations of activity theory. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. We can add it. Do you? If it's necessary. Do you want to ask me questions or how do we proceed? I think you could start talking okay. about cradle. Cradle first. How yeah. the, the history of cradle and how it's organized nowadays, and then mm -hmm. we can. Yeah. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. Some dialogue. Okay. Yeah. I think it would be good if you have further questions or comments. Uh, then, okay. when I go along, you can interrupt. And okay. Sure. Yeah. Cradle. The whole name is the Center for Research on Activity, Development, and Learning, and uh, mm -hmm. the it's a research center within the Institute of Behavioral Sciences here at the University of Helsinki. And uh, as a research center, we are very much dependent on, on uh, grants, uh, various research projects which receive outside funding. And we also run a doctoral program. Monica is in this doctoral program yourself. And uh, a master's program. So we are part of a, a bigger department, but relatively independent, because we also not only do research, but we also have our own training programs, uh, our, our own educational programs. The Cradle was founded in 1994, so we are almost 20 years old. Well, let's say we're 18 years old. and. Uh, the initial name was Center for Activity Theory and Developmental Work Research. Um, a few years ago we changed the name partly because we merged with another research unit here in our department. It was a research unit led by Professor Kai Hakkarainen, which was focused on network learning. <clears throat> but there theoretical approach was becoming very close to ours, so we joined and uh, some of our current researchers have come from that merger. And also the, the original name of our center was a little bit difficult to, to remember and complicated, okay. so this cradle is quite easy. It, the acronym cradle is also quite appropriate because it refers to you know, a, a place where a baby can sleep and grow. And, and uh, we feel that our own ideas and our own approach are something uh, which is still quite young and uh, perhaps even in infancy and, and needs a lot of nurturing. And, and, uh, and at the same time, we also would like to say, serve as a cradle for young researchers such as you, Monica, and, and, and others who come here to, to study and work with us. And um, it has served as such quite well. We have over 30 PhDs who have graduated from our doctoral program over the years. And, and, and uh, this means that we have uh, probably been quite um, successful in <coughs> educating new okay. researchers who base their work on activity theory. So then maybe you could talk a little bit about the about Credo's theoretical approach yeah. Yeah. and uh, also describe a little bit the relation between the theory and the projects you develop in Credo. Yeah. The, Cultural historical activity theory is our foundational um, framework um, and uh, of course this is a broad theoretical approach in which there are different variations 
Uh, in Brazil, I know that, uh, for instance, the work of Yves Claw uh, and his colleagues from Paris, France, has been quite influential, and uh, and he is a good collaboration partner. His approach to activity theory is slightly different, perhaps a bit more psychological, and uh, whereas our, uh, we like to also emphasize a lot the sort of collective and organizational aspects of the activity. Um, the cultural historical activity theory, as we see it, is not only a psychological theory. It is a, an interdisciplinary approach that is relevant for all human and social sciences. And uh, we have here in our center people who come from very diverse scientific backgrounds, ranging from philosophy and, uh, and psychology all the way to uh, engineering and uh, economics and uh, sociology and uh, even medicine. Uh, uh, so this broad um, range of uh, scientific disciplines testifies to the usefulness and, and potential of activity theory across disciplines. And um, <clears throat> in order to pursue that type of, of uh, approach, which is very interdisciplinary, we have to have a very strong theoretical conceptual framework. And uh, our version of activity theory uh, is built very much around the concepts of, of object-oriented activity systems uh, which are collective and uh, which have a long-term uh, durability so that these activity systems are often uh, organized, uh, they take shape as organizations. Uh, of course not only formal organizations, also informal organizations such as communities and families are relevant for us, but we are interested in this relatively longitudinal mm -hmm. uh, processes of change and transformation and development and learning in these collective activity systems which can be modeled and analyzed um, with the help of uh, some foundational models, such as the quite well-known triangular models of, of activity which we use. Mm -hmm. Some people associate us with only those triangles, and I think that's a very um, narrow view of our work. Uh, they are useful models because they are tools. They are conceptual tools they are, they are to be used and tested and changed and and modified and and uh, like any tool they are not in any way the the sort of canonical um, uh, fixed uh, uh, let's say a theory um, of ours they are tools to develop the theory and make the theory work also in practice or rigid as uh, many people, many people see them as rigid, perhaps because people also feel that diagrams themselves are somehow static. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the question is how you use the diagrams, how you make them alive, how you, how you develop and change and, and fill them with contents and put them in particular reality contexts. So, but they are important for us because in itself, this complex triangular model uh, is a was quite a demanding accomplishment as such because uh, the founders of activity theory Vygotsky and Leontiev and, and others never did that kind of modeling. Um, they used some very simple models to indicate the mediational structure of the action, you know, subject uh, object and mediating artifact or mediating sign but the collective aspect of activity which comes from the 
fact that the activities are carried by communities and that these communities have divisional labor and also rules and all these elements have to come together and they are in interplay constantly influencing one another. This kind of modeling has been very important for us and we nowadays work a lot with what we call third generation activity theory which implies that we're not only looking at the single activity system but the interplay between multiple activity systems which somehow are uh, focused on partially the same object. For instance, uh, let's say in the field of healthcare there may be different healthcare providers who treat the same patients and have to somehow find each other, uh, create some forms of collaborative relations between, between each other. Or we study networks of organizations and, and various such <coughs> multi-activity combinations. But that's of course the third generation activity theory as, I, as we call it, is not the only thing we do. We also go increasingly into the, um, let's say, the dynamics of, of the subject, the subjectivity involved in activity. Issues such as how is agency and, uh, and uh, motivation okay. formed? How do people become committed and uh, how, how can they go beyond the existing circumstances, uh, what that, this means for their processes of experiencing and, and uh, uh, in that sense, at the same time as we have expanded the unit of analysis to include multiple activity systems, we have also tried to go deeper into the aspect of the subject. subject. So, the journal we are sending, the interview, it's called Interface. Uh, education, health, education, and communication. Mm -hmm. How would you connect the third generation of activity theory in the research area to these three thematic areas? Health, education, and communication. And communication. Well, <coughs> it's quite interesting that in our center, in the cradle, especially health and education have both been very central um, research areas. <clears throat> in healthcare organizations we have a long tradition. Actually, uh, my own work in healthcare organizations started already before the cradle existed in, in the 1980s and, and uh, some of the healthcare organizations here in Finland such as the health center of the city of Helsinki uh, are very long-term partners in our research so that we have carried on multiple projects and there is a continuity of collaboration mm -hmm. and some of their um, experts who work in those organizations have uh, received uh, their PhDs or, or uh, you know have been trained by us mm -hmm. so that there is a kind of an organic uh, interaction. At the moment, for instance, in Helsinki, we are studying the the care, home care of the old people uh, in the city of Helsinki, which is an increasingly important issue here in Finland because the population is becoming older very rapidly, and and the care of the old people who are sick, uh, but not so sick that they cannot. Uh, that they are not completely dependent on institutional care. So uh, how to provide for forms of care where they can be remained relatively independent, relatively autonomous and how to support that independence are very important issues at the moment here. And um, we also uh, have an ongoing relationship with the major university hospital here in Finland, in, in the north, okay. Oulu University Hospital. So healthcare field uh, is for us very 
important because uh, at least in Finland we still have mostly uh, public health care. That means that it is not only um, um, private business, but, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the society, uh, the public sector uh, is the key uh, organizer of health care. And uh, this allows uh, usually more possibilities for, um, uh, let's say, analysis and, and intervention and change efforts. Uh, because if it's only run by a, 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 the logic of profit, mm -hmm. it is, um, we find it more difficult to, to, to find space for serious development efforts. Often the, simply because the, the, the activity is so you know, tightly connected to relatively short-term profits. Um, the similar thing applies to, to education. We traditionally have had um, a number of, of um, educational institutions which we have studied which are trying to transform themselves, ranging from <coughs> kindergartens to universities. And at the moment, as you know, Monica, um, in our doctoral program we have uh, five doctoral students in our current class of 2012 who all study educational change processes in different countries. If anything, I'm a little bit envious because all of you come from different countries, but not from Finland, and we would need a badly uh, a project about the Finnish educational change. Of course, people can say that Finland is rather well off because our educational system has been quite successful in international PISA comparisons, but still I would say that we're facing also very major transformations in education. Uh, they have to do with, for instance, uh, the issue of how the schools can open up to the society how, and, and how they can motivate uh, young people rather than just uh, make, you know, at the moment Finnish schools are quite good in, uh, in, in academic achievement, but, but the motivational aspect uh, is not that strong. Um, but uh, in any case, I, I would see that um, health and education are very uh, strong streams of our empirical research and our intervention work in which we uh, facilitate change efforts in uh, health and, and educational organizations, typically at the level of, of, of local organizations, but also increasingly in, uh, at the net level of regional networks such as the Helsinki healthcare organizations, how they can work together. and. Uh, Perhaps in the future also at the level of, of uh, let's say, the nationwide institutions. Um, one of our uh, senior colleagues, Professor Reijo Miettinen, has just finished a book in which he discusses the, the, uh, why the uh, Finnish school system has been relatively successful and he focuses much on the special education field in in Finland mm -hmm. and tries to understand it as a, as a sort of a nationwide movement to um, help children and, and families who are uh, having learning difficulties. And this, this type of a sort of nationwide um, movement or institution building is, is an, perhaps another level which goes beyond even regional networks, and uh, I think that um, both in healthcare and in in um, in education, we need to take into account the very local, but also the regional and the nationwide. Uh, yeah, maybe something that you have said before uh, elsewhere about the fact that people want to buy educational system, Finnish educational mm -hmm. systems. And yeah, that's true. There is uh, there is a. Uh, something of a of a rather naive idea that 
let's imitate those who are successful. Mm. And uh, that's w there's been a lot of, let's say, um, educational experts and, and uh, educational um, decision makers who have come to Finland to, to see what they could adopt from the Finnish educational system. I don't think that such an effort is very useful if, it, if you simply try to transplant some solutions that we have here. The cultural conditions in each country and each culture are so specific that you have to, uh, at least from the point of view of activity theory, you have to dig into the history and the historical contradictions and possibilities in the given culture. And of course then at some point you, it's useful to make comparisons also and maybe find best practices um, elsewhere. But um, that doesn't mean that you can transplant them directly. That's uh, for instance, the very fact that we happen to be a, a Protestant country mm -hmm. uh, means that, uh, and we have, have been quite monocultural, you know, uh, traditionally Finns have been re relatively isolated, uh, so we have a very monocultural society still, only now changing to becoming multicultural. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and even the, the religious background has been for uh, nearly 500 years, uh, relatively uh, singular, so that this uh, uh, Lutheran uh, Protestant uh, religion has actually facilitated uh, literacy, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, you know the Protestant Church emerged uh, so that it emphasized that uh, everybody should have their personal relationship to Bible. Therefore, they had to re learn to read and write. So this particular historical fact explains a lot about why literacy is uh, at the high level mm -hmm. in Finland because you know the church before there was any school system actually <clears throat> the, the, the church de required certain literacy from people uh, so these are particular historical conditions which are different in every co country and every culture mm -hmm. and uh, I think <clears throat> what we need is multicultural comparisons and maybe hy hybridizations but not just export import. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, because somehow here in Cradle, there are many people from different countries that mm -hmm. come to uh, investigate or to be part or to study more about the activity theory in health system mm -hmm. and the, the whole development for over these years in in the in the health system mm -hmm. and the projects you develop there. That's true, but I think they're mainly their interest is in the theory and methodology, okay. not so not so much in the specific solutions, mm -hmm. because the specific solutions cannot be easily uh, copied. Uh, but uh, you mentioned also communication, and the field of communication, I think that we can look at it from two, two points of view. On, on one hand, we have also a series of intervention studies in organizations which uh, uh, are in the field of mass communication in particular, newspapers, mm -hmm. broadcast organizations. So that's one area uh, where we have had um, projects with the major newspapers, major uh, broadcasting companies, uh, and also telecommunications mm -hmm. companies. But uh, then on the other hand, the whole issue of communication is of course also a sort of a theoretical question. What, how we see communication as part of the activity? How is what is the relationship between communication and activity? And, uh, you know, there, have, there are theoretical approaches which separate them quite, quite radically. For instance, uh, Jürgen Habermas and his uh, uh, critical uh, uh, theory of communicative action uh, uh, almost puts practical activity and communication against each other and say that uh, the Domain of communication is the sort of domain where you can be free of of power constraints and and hierarchies and and really uh, uh, find an exchange on the base of equality, etc. And then the domain of practical activity is always uh, burdened by power and hierarchy and 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 uh, such constraints. I think that this kind of dualistic notions are deeply wrong. Mm -hmm. 
I think that all practical activities are inherently communicative activities. You cannot do medicine without communicating. You cannot even build a house without communicating. Mm -hmm. And the same way, you cannot only communicate. Uh, much of our communication actually happens by means of practical action. Uh, we are just now studying uh, a very interesting uh, site. Uh, a group of people building um, traditional fishing boats, like the large fishing boats in the, in, the, in the Bay of Bengal in India. And when they build these large boats, they hardly speak to each other because they communicate with their bodies, with their practical actions. Everybody is tuned to, the, to each other and to the whole uh, by, by means of actually seeing the boat. And the boat itself is a communicative device but also, of course, a very practical product. It's the object that they're building, but it actually mediates the also communication between them so that the builders can be in perfect coordination without speaking much or without writing anything. Most of them are actually illiterate. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an example that communication pervades all practical action and they cannot be separated. I think uh, it's a it's a hopeless idea to separate the domain of communication from the domain of practical activity. Uh, this means, of course, that we also have to study a lot of discourse, uh, various forms of using language in practical activities, but not reduce activities to only discourse. Um, do you think we can connect that to the principle to the principle of multivoicedness? That's Certainly, the, yes. yes. Activity. Any activity <laughs> is foundationally multivoiced. Uh, you cannot reduce an activity to a single <clears throat> perspective, to a single subject. Because activities are collective formations and this means that you know no individual, no participant, no subject is, uh, shares exactly the same view, the same perspective, the same interests mm -hmm. uh, with the others. And this multivoicedness is a tremendous source of, of, of uh, potential novelty, innovation, uh, richness, and also resilience in activity systems. You know, when when we look at activity systems which become too monotonous, they are also vulnerable. Mm. You know, they, it's harder for them to find resources to when when there is trouble. On the other hand, if we have a very very diverse activity system where the different participants don't understand each other, then we have fragmentation. So we are, look, look, one dimension to look at activity systems and their change is to look at uh, issues of fragmentation versus uh, uh, total unification. Uh, you know, uh, it, you, you move in this dimension all the time. Uh, many people who uh, think that uh, the only way to manage organizations is to make them completely under control, you know, in a sense totally predictable. Mm. Uh, many people like that think that uh, excessive diversity is, uh, must be eliminated, but of course uh, diversity is something which when you orchestrate it, when, you, when people find ways to play together, uh, it's a tremendous source of, of energy and richness. Uh, so um, these are uh, certainly at the core of, of our research. And uh, for instance, in, in, uh, in medicine, um, you know, just looking at any clinic where you have multiple doctors and, and talking to these doctors, investigating how they see the patient, you usually see m multiple different models uh, of the patient, multiple different, different ways to conceptualize uh, the object. Some take the more the classical biomedical view, some take a more sociomedical view, some take a more psychotherapeutic view. And if these can play together somehow, they're of course stronger. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the change laboratory? Yes, the, our version of activity theory is inherently interventionist. Uh, we see that in in the history of activity theory, already Vygotsky and his followers, uh, Leontiev, Luria, uh, Davidov and others, 
they were also doing interventions. Their research was based on the idea that you can actually find potentials and possibilities by intervening, by, by creating new challenges and new settings in which uh, people can uh, sort of step to the next level or next zone of proximal development of their own activity. And for that you need interventions. Um, I think that the intervention methodologies uh, that uh, our uh, Soviet and Russian colleagues developed uh, remained a little bit um, they were not fully articulated. They never formulated these methodologies very, very fully. Uh, so it's the task of our generations to, to, to make these methodologies more systematic, explicit, and, and, and also, you know, make them responsive to today's needs. And um, there are the multiple intervention methodologies that activity theoretical researchers are using. Uh, I, I mentioned Yves Clo and his research group, they use the, what they call the clinic of activity. And, and we have developed particularly this change laboratory method. The change laboratory itself is, uh, is actually, uh, the idea is that when a collective, uh, let's say it's a organization or unit of an organization, perhaps a, a community, uh, are, in a, in a, are facing an important transformation, some change which is not easy to master, uh, in which they need to somehow um, create their own vision and their own agency to, to, to direct their own uh, development. Then, bringing in those people or at least a representative group of these people into um, a series of sessions often we have about 10 sessions with uh, roughly once a week or every two weeks where we sit down and start by uh, presenting what we call mirror material namely uh, uh, material which is often uh, videotaped but also other kinds of materials statistics, uh, interviews, etc., uh, in which, which demonstrate uh, things that create problems and trouble, breakdowns, disturbances, sometimes even crises in the organization, in the, in the, in the activity. And who, who makes part of this? Um, usually it's us researchers who collect the data, but uh, when we have a long-term partnership, we often can uh, rely on the local participants, the, the practitioners themselves, okay. to collect this data. But if we, if we enter a new activity system, we often have to do it ourselves. And that might, may take several months uh, to collect this kind of background data and to, uh, and to also dig into the history of this particular activity. And then in these change laboratory sessions, we present selective examples of that kind of data, that kind of evidence, and ask them to tell what they see in it and why is this happening. Uh, what is happening and why? And this often creates a very strong, what we call, um, um, first a critical conflict and perhaps even a double bind situation where people feel that something must be done to change this, but we don't know what. And from this kind of strong motivational commitment, which is often also quite conflictual, because people also uh, they they would like to deny it, so there is uh, you need to work on it enough so that the involvement uh, becomes a serious engagement and and commitment to to change, and then um, you know from that we move to the history to ask, okay, where did this trouble start? When did this happen? What, what, what are the roots? And already there we start using these models, for instance, the, the triangular models of the activity, but also other tools such as historical timelines to try identify cycles of change in the history of the given activity. And so it's not anymore just sort of emotional engagement with, with things that go wrong, but then it becomes also intellectual uh, distance analysis. Mm -hmm. And you have to 
move between this personal emotional engagement and and a little more detached analytical uh, uh, kind of conceptual work. Uh, and this movement is very, very crucial. Um, so th through the historical analysis, which often, you, you know, we, we like to build it so that people bring their own personal histories or into it too. You know, when did I come to, uh, to, to this activity? When did I uh, start this work? And so, uh, what happened then? How was it different then? How is it now? And uh, um, through this history, we, they build kind of hypothesis of what are the structural systemic contradictions behind these problems. And, and that leads then to the efforts to model the future. And the future modeling, uh, you know, there you also may use comparisons with other similar activities elsewhere to, to get kind of um, impulses and ideas and, and just to, to play with the, the future possibilities to sort of construct a vision for your own zone of proximal development. And uh, then this leads to uh, that we, we typically decide together with the practitioners that certain aspects of this future model can be implemented now, right now, here and now, in the next few months. And let's see what, what you can do with them. In other words, they select a, a kind of sub-projects which they then test in practice. And we follow up on that and gradually, because you know, you cannot, you can never just implement a whole new model like this overnight and change everything right now. You have to sort of build this change into the existing activity and gradually transform it. And this is, of course, the, the implementation phase can be very, very demanding. So we try to follow that up and, and support that also with the follow-up meetings uh, of the change laboratory. Uh, the, this whole process is a kind of condensed and and uh, and pressurized uh, process of expansive learning, as we call it. So, um, you know, the actual change laboratory sessions may may be run in.